afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is a special session, and obviously, I would entertain a motion to go into special session at this Second. time. Have a motion by Mr. Second. Monson. Second by Mr. Brubaker. Any discussion? All in favor of going into special session, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, the first item is an approval of an ordinance authorizing legal counsel and staff to commence with eminent domain proceedings at the Old City Light Plant, otherwise known as the Melt Property. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move that the Mayor and City Council approve an ordinance to authorize legal counsel and staff to commence with eminent domain proceedings against property legally described as Lot 2, 2.9. 633 acres on the east side of Eastern Boulevard, known as the Old City Light Milp, further identified in SDAT as located in District 17, account number 025759. Public purpose of the em eminent domain proceedings are related to the protection and continued operation of public utilities contained within and adjacent to the property and public safety concerns related to the condition of the property. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the or, uh, motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion is approved. The ordinance is approved. Next on the agenda is the introduction of an ordinance authorizing a three-month extension to the cable television franchise agreement with Antietam Cable Television, Inc. Mr. Mayor, I hereby move that the attached ordinance be introduced to author authorize a three-month extension of the cable television franchise agreement with Antietam Cable Television, Inc. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries and the ordinance is introduced. That is the close of our special session. So at this point, we'll go into work session. Uh, the first item on our work session agenda is a proclamation. And at this point, I would like to uh, bring up uh, Sila Bartel and Diana Reyes. have a proclamation here for each of you. Welcome. Thank you for Thank being you here. Much. And uh, if you don't mind standing here and facing our, our audience here for the television viewers at home, uh, this is or uh, will be Hispanic Heritage Month starting this Sunday, the 15th of September, and going through October 15th, uh, 2013. And this is a proclamation declaring it such. Whereas Hispanic Americans are the youngest and fastest growing minority in our nation, and whereas the vibrant Hispanic influence can be seen in all aspects of American life and culture, and its contributions help illustrate all that is best about our great nation, and whereas in order to pay tribute to and recognize the important achievements of Hispanic Americans, Hispanic Heritage Week began in 1968, and the observance was expanded in 1988 to Hispanic Heritage Month by the passage of Public Law 100-402 as a 31-day commemoration beginning on September 15 and ending on October 15. And whereas, September 15 is significant as the anniversary of independence for the Latin American countries of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate their independence on September 16 and September 18, respectively. Also, Columbus Day, or Dia de la Raza, Sorry about that, I'm not very good at Spanish. Which is October 12, falls within this 31 day period. Now therefore, with the support of the City Council, I, David Geisberts, the Mayor of the City of Hagerstown, do hereby recognize September 15 through October 15, 2013, as Hispanic Heritage Month in Hagerstown, Maryland, and encourage our citizens to join in the activities designed to facilitate recognition, understanding, and appreciation of the significant contributions made by Hispanic Americans. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank uh, you. I have one for each of you. Thank you very much. And I know that on um, this Sunday, the 15th, there will be a festival. And uh, would you like to 
tell the folks more about that and how they can learn more about it? This is our seventh annual Hagerstown Hispanic Festival. Um, the purpose of the festival is to raise funds for, um, oh, thank you. I'm sorry. To raise funds for Hispanic students attending HCC. Since we started, we've given over 28 scholarships. Um, Another purpose also is to just promote our diversity here in town, have everybody come out, no matter what race, color, shape, size, or form you are, and just celebrate um, good Hispanic food, Hispanic dancing, uh, Hispanic traditions, and it also gives the community, the Hispanic community mainly, uh, a base for vendors and exhibitors that want to promote their businesses um, and target the Hispanic community that day. And where and when? Hagerstown Fairgrounds Park, um, Sunday, September 15th. The time is from 12 to 6. And we invite all of you to come out there and shake your salsa <laughs> hips with us. Right. And uh, while we're here, I know there's Zumba happening uh, on Friday in the central lot here. Do you want to say a little more about that? Yeah. Um, uh, I will be there from <laughs> 6 o'clock till 6.10. Right. So there's about eight instructors, and we're getting together to promote um, Zumba and mainly to collect funds for the Walnut Free Clinic. So um, Anita Binder has been organizing that in the cities behind us. They picked the best Zumba instructors. I don't know how I got picked. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and so, so the event starts yeah. at 530. I think 530 it goes through 730, 730 at the central lot. Event. It's what, $10 if you sign up in advance? Mm -hmm. And I think 13 $5 for kids. $5 for kids. Because kids are welcome too. Right. And the whole idea is to get people aware of getting active and staying healthy and also goes to a good cause for the community free clinic too. So Correct. Thank you for all you're doing in the community. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Sila, would you like to say a few words? Certainly. Um, the, as Diana mentioned, the festival is a celebration of the Hispanic uh, culture here in Hagerstown. As you all know, the Hispanic uh, population continues to grow. And this is a celebration not just for Hispanic, but, the, but also for the community at large. And uh, like Diana said, we invite you all and hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Thanks. Okay? Oh, sure. Do you want to grab the pad? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And three, one, two, three. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks again for being here. We'll see you on Sunday. Okay. The next item on our agenda is the recycling program participation update. And here's our city engineer, and I think we have some representatives from waste management here today. Yes, with me today is uh, Pat Harity, the district manager of waste management. Pat's an elected official up in Pennsylvania, so he feels your pain. <laughs> <laughs> There's no pain, it's all pleasure. <laughs> Antrim Township. Oh, okay. Well, Rodney, do you want to go ahead and Yeah, I'd just like to go through the memo and highlight a few things. I think Pat has a couple things to add, so uh, stop me if you uh, have any questions. But um, as we all know, the uh, program was drastically changed at the beginning of 2012. We basically implemented the uh, task force that was put together back in 2011. We implemented their recommendations. Uh, Mary, you were involved in that task force. Uh, last April, the totes were distributed, the recycling totes around the community, and the program has been running since then. Uh, residents pay $156 per unit, and that was a decrease from what was being paid before by about $7 annually. As far as trash collection goes, the results of the program, uh, the uh, amount of trash that is collected and disposed in a landfill has gone down. About a thousand tons per year. Uh, to put that in human terms, I, I like to use the City Park Lake as an example. If you looked at the lake, if it was a foot deep, uh, that's how much a thousand tons of trash. So that much trash is not going into the landfill, just to give you some perspective on that. So we are uh, throwing away less, and also every ton that we dispose is being done at a much cheaper rate. We were paying almost $60 a ton and now we're paying $42 a ton. So that's good news and uh, again everything I 
come, everything I say here is going to be because the citizens of Hagerstown have really stepped up and I think um, have really uh, tried to embrace uh, recycling and uh, disposing less. Recycling, uh, there's a graph in your packet that shows how the recycling tonnages have changed over the course of the last, say, three years, and I think it pretty much speaks for itself. You can see when we started the single stream recycling program in January, there was a start, start of an uptick, but when the totes were issued, it seems like that's when the recycling tonnages just really moved in a positive direction. And right now, since the program has been uh, started, we are averaging 212 tons of recyclables collected every month. That's about a 130% increase since the program, before in the old program when we had the old two bin system. Um, so we continue to want to push uh, to see that improve, but it's definitely heading in the right direction. Uh, the totes, uh, there was, there was a lot of discussion about when we purchased the totes, and it was a, uh, about 12,000 of those was purchased in the city. Uh, the debt service on those was about $73,000 a year for about 10 years, and the good news is that the savings on the landfill disposal costs is about $140,000 a year, so uh, almost double the revenue needed to cover the debt service is, is saved by not throwing so much trash into the landfill, even at the reduced rates, the landfill rates. So um, um, the, we have issues with the, some of the totes being stored in the public right-of-way. Uh, that's something we continue to, to deal with, where people put the totes in the right-of-way and they're not using them properly. We can tell that because the equipment that's on the um, waste management truck will tell us if they're not being um, serviced. Uh, or not being used. So if they're not being used and they're sitting in the right of way, we take them away. We have waste management take them away. Uh, if they are using them, we've sent them nice letters asking them to um, please continue to recycle, but please store it somewhere else. Uh, that's had minimal impact. So we still have some people that are recycling, but storing them out in the right of way. And at this point, we haven't had them removed. Um, but um, that, that continues to be an issue, especially in the downtown area. How many totes would you say you've actually had to take off because they weren't being used? You may know better than I do. Three or four hundred, maybe? Yeah. Three or four hundred. I know some people, you know, if they, well, I didn't want this, this is a, the city's littering by putting this tote in my yard or, you know, on my property. You know, I guess they're just the, the people who will never adopt And we've recycling. taken those away. But on the flip side, when a new house is built or uh, a new unit goes online, we take them a tote. And, uh, or usually we'll have people requesting totes. Mm -hmm. We have some people requesting more Bigger than one totes, tote, right. and we'll, we'll service that too. And just so people know, if they find that they new, do need a bigger tote, I think there's a way for them to swap out yes, their absolutely. tote for a larger tote. Absolutely. Up, upsize or downsize. Mm -hmm. Right. We want it to fit their, their, their lifestyle. The Recycle Bank program is the incentive program that is geared to try to encourage people to recycle. There's a sheet in the packet on how that program works. It's a little bit confusing, but basically the gist of it is that uh, if you participate in the recycling program, you sit your tote at curbside, you will receive uh, points of which you can redeem uh, and receive coupons for. So just some of the facts and figures of that program, about 28%, uh, 28.6% of the residents have become members of the Recycle Bank program. and. The Recycle Bank folks tell me that's a strong percentage um, for our community. They, they look at Hagerstown as being one of their poster childs. They, they really uh, feel like the program here has been accepted well by the community. Uh, the citizens have earned over 977,000 reward points. Um, and that has resulted in a total number of 4,246 uh, unique rewards being issued by Recycle Bank to uh, the residents. So in dollar terms, over the last 12 months, that means that about $39,866, almost $40,000 in discounts and coupons have been redeemed by the residents of Hagerstown because they simply put their recycling tote at the end of the curb. In addition to that, there's this uh, thing called the co-spend if you have a program where you say um, you, you um, 
have $5 off a $20 purchase. That $15 is considered the co-spend. And over the last 12 months, Recycle Bank reports that that's about $42,900. And the good news is there that those are mostly spent in local businesses. And, and so we have the savings, but we also have the, the co-spending. Other dollars circulating Other dollars in the that economy. are going into the local mm -hmm. economy. Hmm. We try to continue to monitor that program to make sure that it's meeting the needs of everyone. We, uh, we have uh, conference calls with Recycle Bank uh, every other month to try to keep that program as vibrant as possible. And they, they've done a pretty good job of sending out flyers and keeping people aware of the program, and we do that as well. And I think it's important uh, to note do, you know, where it says do, the city enjoys a financial rebate when the amount of recycling each month exceeds 105 tons. And due to the tremendous recycling efforts by the citizens to date, the city has received $17,170 in cash payments from waste management. And that, that money was used to pay for the extension of the yard waste program. But that's cash that the city earned from that's the correct. citizens. That's a check cut directly to the, the city of Hagerstown based mm -hmm. on exceeding the, if you're target. a glass half empty or glass half full, ceiling or floor, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you exceed the ceiling mm -hmm. on, the, on the tonnage. Um, a rebate is is offered to the city uh, per the contract, uh, and we're averaging anywhere from a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month in <clears throat> rebates sent to the city. So you would say it was exceeding the expectations, and probably of I think we exceeded the day, expectations yeah. in the very first month, mm -hmm. um, and we've been paying rebates since uh, June of of two thousand and twelve. And that's what we like to hear. They've just. <laughs> continue to exceed, and we like to see yeah. that too. So. so the more everybody recycles, the more the city can actually benefit from that. Well, you receive cash right. payments from from our company. Mm -hmm. um, your land your 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 land fillable tonnage is down. Mm -hmm. Your recyclable tonnage is way up, um, and the offset is that uh, you you are you're recognizing the value of. Uh, it promoting the recycling program by not placing those tons into a into a landfill mm -hmm. at a much higher rate of uh, a much higher rate. Rodney, uh, are are we ready for questions? Sorry, I've just been ready. interrupting. It's a free flowing conversation, yeah. Mr. Brubaker. Please <laughs> right. ask your question. Oh, I'm, I'm in polite mode today. I know. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the uh, reaching out to those that aren't recycling now we're going to send letters we can we can tell because of those barcodes right and and correct yeah. you know which barcodes went down a street or something so not you know only which the, well not, 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 not just the barcode but the, the, the RFID, RFID chip, chip mm -hmm. that is the embedded chip, right, inside okay. of the tower right, right. Uh, and the device that's you just know by the fact that it's not getting scanned that it's correct. not being used right. so if that toter scan. does not come within the the rear of our vehicle it's not right. going to be scanned right, right. right. So we know where all the totes are in the city, or at least initially mm -hmm. where they were. We know yeah. they moved some. But um, uh, if they're not being serviced, then we know that address, and we can send a letter to that address saying, very politely, we see you're not recycling, or at least your totes not being mm -hmm. sent out. Uh, we'd like to invite you to recycle and um, you know, call us if we can help you do that. Yeah, and get reward points. List the that. benefits, yeah. yeah correct. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're going to try to do in the next few months here. Is there a particular? Uh, Neighbor area, where is it pretty much scattered through the city where we're not getting response? I would say it's pretty scattered. scattered. Some areas are heavier than others. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that, but mm -hmm. um, um, it, it varies throughout the city. But mm -hmm. we'll probably target some of the uh, residential areas um, outlying the city mm -hmm. first. I mean, the tag on to that question uh, of the trash that's being thrown away. Certainly, a great deal of it could be recyclable, uh, I suspect. Do you have any concept, any thoughts about how much of it could be recyclable if, if people actually uh, worked a little harder, maybe? Usually, when, when, when a recycling program is initiated that is not mandatory, but, but a recycling program that is well advertised, much like the city did uh, when we first started this, um, we saw recycling participation go from about 20% to upwards of 60%. Um, 
and that was a combination of the recycle bank program, the totes, uh, single stream, and the addition of the collection all in one day. So, um, but uh, to answer your question, pr probably about 25% of what is being from the residents that are not recycling currently could probably be recycled if they if they would use the toter that was provided for them. Our diversion rate, which is the number that the industry likes to use on how much a material is not going into a landfill, how much is being diverted away. If you take the yard waste plus the recycling and divide it by the total uh, yard waste recycling and garbage that's thrown away, our diversion rate was 18 percent, um, basically uh, less, you know, one out of every five uh, pounds, we'll say right, that way, correct. whatever unit you want to use, was recycled or diverted from the landfill before. Now it's almost 30. Uh, it's and the state and has a goal of like 40 or 50 or something like that. By yeah, the national average is a third, 33 percent. So, and, and what's ours again? It's uh, 28 and a half. 28 and a half. So we're approaching that. Right. Right. Wow, we're not e we're doing well, but we're not even at the exactly. national. Exactly. We still have work to do. Yeah. Right. right. Rodney, there's a commercial side to this program too, where we enhance mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. for commercial customers. Right. Has that been a success? Getting commercial. I customers? think for the people that. Are, uh, that, that want use it, it's a success. Here's what I mean by that is we have limits on how much we can take. We basically give them 95 gallon totes and we say if you can handle that much capacity for a week of recycling, 95 gallons of uh, capacity for trash, then we're the program for you. It's very reasonably priced and we've had uh, a fair number of people take advantage of that, especially the recycling. We have uh, 50 different businesses in the city that are 49 that are just recycling with our program. But if you have more trash than that, if you have more recycling than that, mostly if you have more trash than that, then we tell them to, to hook up with a private hauler or get a dumpster or something like that because it's probably beyond what we can just sit out on the side. Mm -hmm. right. so, so I think it's a good start. I know one of the issues I sat not only on the task force uh, back in 2011, I guess it was, but also the um, the uh, county solid waste advisory commission which apparently is no longer in operation i don't think they ever notified us but apparently they've done away with that organization they're looking to retool it as something like environmental matters or something but it really did uh create a hit on the county landfill when the city stopped sending their trash because waste management has their own landfill across the border um, also, uh, and I know this is a bunch of trash talk, but um, what other ways would there be to divert trash other than recycling a yard waste? I mean, that's pretty much it. Well, there are composting. No other, okay. Um, which I don't know if any communities use. Composting or waste energy. Waste energy. And unfortunately, in this area, currently, there is no waste energy facility that is you know, economically feasible to transport that waste too. Now that may change uh, in the next two to three years uh, with a proposed site in Frederick, Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, but um, industry speculation is the, you know, the chance of that happening is slim to none. Just because they're, 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 they have a difficult issue with getting volume enough to, to make that kind of a facility feasible. So really the only way to increase the amount of diversion is to increase participation in the existing programs. In, in my 25 years of experience, the best way to do it is kind of the way that, that, that Rodney has, has uh, taken to approach it. Reach out to the citizens, get a task force together, get the best ideas together in the same room, educate the public, make it economically feasible for them to do it, give them an incentive to do it, um, show that it saves money for the community, and try to give some of that money back to them in some way. Um, and that works. <coughs> Any other questions? From no, I'll just a comment to follow up on you. Uh, unfortunately, some of our citizens think there's a, a, another way. Perhaps they think it's a better way to get rid of their trash. Uh, they, they throw it on the ground <laughs> in the gutter. And um, a lot of people in this community who complain about the amount of trash. And I know that our, our staff uh, works very hard to clean the trash up, but uh, 
unfortunately, we do have a lot of people who throw is, stuff right in the gutter. I'm assuming littering is illegal in the city of Hagerstown. Mm -hmm. Do we know how much of a fine there is attached to that? Does anyone know? Is there a fine? I'm just curious because I, I agree with Councilmember Munson. It's illegal Munson. in the state. I mean, right. It's, it's a crime in the state. Right, in addition to just being repugnant and morally wrong. But I do, I notice the amount of trash too, and I wonder if we need to put in strategic locations throughout the city little signs that say, you know, littering is a, you know, can get you this much of a fine or something like that as a term. But anyway, that's kind of an aside. Another issue related to this, and I think I'd, I'd let Rodney know I would bring this up, but I know, and this actually came from a resident in Penny's neighborhood who, uh, is still uh, hoping that there will be twice a week trash pickup in the more densely populated areas of the city. Can you tell us where the boundary, I know there is twice a week pickup in the core of downtown, mm -hmm. but what is that, well, like what are the boundaries of that area? Uh, it's, in the downtown, it's about Baltimore Street to the south, uh, like Walnut to the west, parts of Mulberry, but not all of Mulberry to the east, and church or just north of yeah. church yeah. and what we tried to do when we laid the program out was look at the multi-unit buildings mm -hmm. right and if a building had five six eight ten units in it you imagine once a week that would be a mountain of trash so it was decided that we would uh, provide twice a week service for them so we'd have too many piles right. of trash so to speak and um, that was the idea there um, I don't know, can you speak to what you've seen in other communities as far as twice a week? Um, I mean, my local district has dozens of municipal contracts and, and there we do not have any that uh, have twice a week service. In fact, I did a little investigating before I came here uh, in our market area, which is uh, most of Pennsylvania, all of West Virginia, all of Maryland, all of Virginia. There's two municipal contracts that actually require twice a week service. That's an, an ordinance mm -hmm. uh, that was passed, and the one actually uh, has changed their ordinance, and their most recent bid specs, I guess, do not, will, will reflect a, uh, a bid requirement of one time a week service for all of, uh, all of those things. And I think most of the time, when municipalities are, are looking at that as the additional wear and tear on their streets, which is a huge percentage of their, of their annual budget, is roads mm -hmm. and road maintenance. So um, I think for at least this particular resident, uh, full disclosure is my cousin Kim, I knew that. who lives right down the street. I knew that. <laughs> but in the more, that. even in that. the uh, uh, non apartment building types of uh, sure. communities, you have very close quarters or maybe even no yard sure. in between. Maybe you have a little walk through right. and people put their trash right off the back porch and maybe they have uh, four babies and they're changing four kids' diapers every day and it starts in the summer. So I'm, I guess what I'm suggesting is maybe we take a look at, you know, really pinpoint some of these other neighborhoods maybe outside of the current area that, oh, and really I'm looking at only in the summertime, perhaps, uh, in the warmer months when trash sure. starts to cook, that maybe uh, we could, maybe with some of the rebate money that we get, we might be able to, to do twice a week trash pickup in some of those more densely. And, and we're areas. open to any suggestions that that you that you as a body may have to to expand that, even if it's in zone F in the downtown area. It just um, would be good to try to monitor what we actually do have on the streets. You know, I mean, there's there's um, a double up the street, and your trash people actually thought that it was a set out, and they have six children on each side. Sure. Okay, it wasn't a set out but this is what we get to look at. And I want to tell you something. The guys that you have, honestly, I don't know how they handle it in the summer. That's my concern. Sure. Because, I mean, when they're dumping, you might as well have a safety suit on and everything else because Understood. it is horrendous in the it's summertime. It's a tough job. <laughs> in the summertime, I mean, you know, there's no, way, there's no way that you can stop flies, which continue to. And this is my problem with, with only once a week in the summertime. It's a, it's a major problem yeah, yeah. and what about because I know I want to try to keep to the agenda and honor the time because I know we we're on a time crunch tonight to, to end on time but about pickup in alleys this has been another mm -hmm. concern that I hear of from a lot so that instead of trash being put out on the front sidewalk in front of houses is it possible to use the alleys for what they were intended which was yeah, for those kinds of services 
I yeah, we've, we've actually done a lot of research on that. And yeah. I think I've made a couple presentations in my career here to the city council about that. The couple issues that we found in the past. So turning radii and three, things like that. One, it was tough for the larger trucks to get in the alleys. Right. But more importantly, there's plenty of um, residential properties, especially in the downtown, that don't actually go the whole way to the alley. There's other properties that run in behind them, like some of these garages and things that are actually owned by other people. Mm -hmm. So those people would have to take their garbage out around the whole right. block, basically, to bring in there. That was the second issue. The third issue was that uh, we thought that the alleys then uh, would people take their garbage back and not necessarily put it right behind their property? Would we, would we need like centralized collection places? It seemed like there was going to be issues with the trash in the alleys and where it all right. would be collected. But could, if you can imagine, I mean, us in the, in the transportation business trying to fit a big truck down some of the narrow city streets oh, sure. is difficult enough with mm -hmm. cars parked on both sides. Trying to fit them through an alley now, if you're putting totes and other garbage cans and all those kinds of things in those alleys, makes it even harder. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, you know, kind of it, it, that that we've noticed recently, and it's and it's just it's sporadic, but uh, uh, low hanging wires in mm -hmm. the alleys when you're trying to bring larger vehicles through uh, through the alleys is also presents a challenge, and we certainly don't want to tear somebody's phone wire or cable wire down as we're trying to trying to do our job. So. In cases where we actually have to enter an alley, uh, because that's the only way that we can we can safely service that, we have a, a, a smaller pickup truck. That I was just going to say, through. do you have smaller trucks? Or? We have a small pickup truck that goes through the alleys in some of these uh, some of these spots, and I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly how many there are, but maybe half a dozen or so that we, that, that we send a small pickup through that, that services the trash first and then goes back through for the recycle and back through for the yard waste on those service days. Well, I appreciate you looking into the issue and researching it anyway. Mr. Alshire? Um, just so I understand correctly, what you said is you, you, you basically you doled out the bins mm -hmm. and a number of individuals have contacted the city and said, I, I don't want the bin, I don't want to use it. Um, even though we sent the postcards out, if you remember, that said that you don't want them opt out. Right. So, so we had a few do that, yeah. So when you, the city, send me a bill with my quarterly water and sewer bill, what is the cost for trash service on that bill? It would be $38 um, a okay. quarter. So it's $38 a quarter, mm -hmm. somewhere in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. When you send a bill to a property owner that has opted out of using the recycling bin, what is the bill? Same. That, to me, when you talk about removing a thousand tons of trash in a year from the landfill, not having that cost of tipping fees, and I work for a small municipality and we have mandatory recycling and it works uh, wonderfully. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a proponent of that you know, eight years ago, I think, when we started down this road uh, here in this city mm -hmm. uh, and, and couldn't get the votes for it then. Uh, but I'm a firm believer in once a week. I think if there are, you know, two or three hundred jurisdictions that do it now uh, with, with, with uh, little issue, uh, I, I think that there's no reason Hagerstown can't continue to do that. Uh, I think that if you are going to refuse to use a recycling tote, that reduces the cost to the city for disposal of trash, then your trash bill should be more. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we talk about incentivizing things. I think mm -hmm. we need to talk about, you know, the, the reverse on that. That's more of a nudge. Um, I think they like to call that in the business. Because if I'm going to participate in that and fill that bin up every week, um, and somebody's going to voluntarily decide simply not to which increases the cost to the city for those tipping fees uh, and frankly for the collection uh, and wait, I, I think that, that there should be an additional cost. Uh, you know, uh, well, the mechanism is in decision. place with the, with the program that we're, that we're running right now um, that you can identify mm -hmm. those residents that are not using that program. Mm -hmm. So maybe the first start is a little gentle persuasion, mm -hmm. invite them. Yeah. But perhaps we get to a point where in order to increase the rate of diversion, we have mandatory. I think it's a conversation worth having mm -hmm. uh, because I do. I agree with Mr. Alshire. People will complain, well, I'm not using it. I shouldn't have to pay. Well, you're paying for the service. Why don't you use it? Really? I mean, that's 
what it boils down to. But how difficult is it going to be because you have a lot of people that don't use it that for the most part are renters mm -hmm. where I live. I mean, they'll fill it up with everything else but recycle. Unfortunately. Well, there's ways I think that the city. You know, well, I mean, but it's going to be di that. very difficult because a lot of your renters continue to move around and around. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do For that sure. when it comes to building? Building the, well, the, the whole billing mechanism then is going to. Well, you and the know, tote stays with the property. I mean, it's no. that's the way I understand. Yeah, but it, still, so. I mean, Kristen's saying you know they should be, but how do you? How do well, you we fix talked that about problem? even you know, on the task force. We talked about low hanging fruit, and I think we identified people who rent as maybe I mean, a, if, if a, a target group. If you've spent six hundred thousand dollars purchasing these totes and you've only increased, and I know it's a good number, but you've only increased mm -hmm. your overall diversion rate by twelve percent, then then I don't think you're getting your your bang for your buck, so to, so to speak, or your return on investment on a purchase of that volume of bins. Uh, and I think that that you know, and I look at the Frederick County model. I mean, that was clearly the goal in that model was diversion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that we need to take whatever steps are necessary to, to increase that diversion rate because at the end of the day I'd like to hear that we're you know diverting three hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. worth of creditable uh, <laughs> tonnage, you know, not hundred and seventy six thousand. Right. Well I think the next step for us will be sending these letters. That's something we can do um, and um, We'll see, we'll measure that result and then we can look into this. We can have sure. more trash talk to come on the agenda. Well, mm -hmm. thank you very much for this update. It's very uh, informative and uh, personally, I think it's exciting. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you very much. You Appreciate your time. Yeah, Lou, Lou thinks Lou it's likes exciting. Junk, no, Lou likes junkyards. Oh. <laughs> Don't you, Lou? Junkyards are beautiful. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is uh, transportation priorities. I think probably all of you know that every year the Maryland Department of Transportation Secretary, um, who is now uh, James Smith, and the uh, State Highway Administrator, uh, right now is Melinda Peters, uh, they tour the state and they just like to hear from the local governments and local officials as to what our priorities are for transportation dollars and, and um, transportation spending. So uh, next week I have a meeting with some of their staff. They won't be here, the, but the staff will be here and we'd like to give them some feedback as to what we see as our priorities. So every year I try to get the, the feedback from the Mayor and Council. I think the Board of County Commissioners does the same and uh, we collectively meet with them. So I just put a few suggested priorities on here. Uh, I'd like to hear your feedback as to how you'd like me to add to this, delete from this, prioritize this, and I'll just go through them quickly, and then you can give me your feedback. Um, first and foremost was highway user revenue, although it's, it's bumped up a little bit in the last couple of years. Now we're over the $300,000 mark. It wasn't too long ago that we were getting well over a million dollars in highway user revenue, and this was one of the major um, financial impacts that the city had to face here in the recent past. So um, be advocating for continued um, increases there. Rodney, can we just disturb sure. mm -hmm. uh, I think this needs, you have it number one here, I think this one needs to remain number one. And obviously the administration is, is sympathetic to this particular issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, they uh, increased it, I guess, last session, right? Right and it needs to be, continued to be increased. So, um, this particular one, I think, is uh, really very important. Uh, and, and Don, I'd like to illuminate on that since we started on this. Uh, I, and these numbers may not be quite right, but order of magnitude, they're, they're close. Uh, we, the municipality statewide got in the mid 40s back in uh, 2008 or 2009, last year, full funding, $45 million to, to spread out. Um, make, uh, MACO, the county organization, was asked which of their, when the, when the 2008 financial crisis hit, was asked which of their uh, funding sources would they like, I mean, this is all informal, behind the back, would, would they like to see cut, and, and the least damage to them was 
highway user revenues, which impact every single municipality in the state. Um, the municipalities were not consulted. Um, we were cut back to somewhere between seven and nine million uh, from 45, it just a huge, almost wiped it out. And that was where we were for a few years. Uh, last year, um, again, these numbers are approximate. The governor added for municipalities another 16 million, bringing the total funding up to the neighborhood in the mid 20s, where it used to be in the mid 40s for municipalities only, not for the, the counties did not get any of theirs back. But that was not a permanent increase. That was uh, one and or two time, probably two time increase for this last year of this administration. But it's not incorporated in the formula, nor was the municipal revenue guaranteed when they redid the formula for the gas taxes this past time. Uh, this has once again been the, uh, this once again will be the uh, MML highest priority issue, uh, but we fought it every year. Uh, and uh, we talked to both the lieutenant governor and the governor about it personally, um, but we don't have assurances, so it's going to, you know, require a, a, a lot. And the success of that depend, it will result in how much we get. But uh, most likely, there will once again be a one-time stipend, but we can't write it into those five-year forecasts because uh, it's not in the formula. So that, that's the tricky situation there. Um, and, and since I started on MML, I think I will mention one more thing. Uh, although the committee voted by far to make double taxation the second highest priority after highway user revenues, after much debate and discussion, several hours of it, uh, it was decided to make it not an initi a legislative initiative this year, but to take it to MACO and the legislative leaders over the year instead of just this fall since um, uh, the, the, the representation is is it's not a popular legislative subject and uh, they'll send us to MACO. Anyhow, MACO will, uh, it'll be a very difficult issue to deal with with MACO. And so uh, for a lot of reasons, it was decided to stall it, but that it, it would be introduced uh, the year after this. Uh, so uh, to the extent that can be, uh, MML can abide by that, uh, that's where that issue is. Thank you for the update. Yeah. So we won't, at any rate, we won't get action on it this year, it doesn't look like. It'll be more of a year of negotiating. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions. The, um, I agree about number one being highway user revenues. Um, I know the Eastern Boulevard corridor improvements have been around for a while. Access management plan for uh, 65 from Lyles Drive to Wilson Boulevard. What area is this? Well, it would be you know past South High, uh, going out to Interstate 70, and the game changer there is the major retailer that starts with a W that's going right. to be out there very soon. Right. And when they show up, it just the congestion levels just change significantly. Right. They're going to be um, doing a lot of improvements uh, as part of their approval through the county, mm -hmm. but there's just going to be a lot more traffic in that corridor. So gotcha. we just want to make sure we're prepared for that. The state is willing to do the study. We don't have to have any financial participation, but um, it would be good for them to complete that study and, and see what impacts um, the, what the future holds for us in that corridor. Is anyone starting to talk about, speaking of that neck of the woods, when the, what was going to happen when the outlets open in Clarksburg? what's going to happen to the outlets here in uh, Washington County, because that might divert a lot of traffic from, from that area, too. I mean, that's certainly a consideration. But anyway, the status of the I-70 and 81 planning studies, I would hope, and when uh, the uh, mayors of Washington County met with Congressman Delaney, we, we stressed that the expansion of Interstate 81 has to be a priority. And even though the city of Hagerstown really doesn't have a lot to do with Interstate 81, I know there's a coalition uh, through the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and uh, Maryland is going to be on the losing end of this because Pennsylvania is already widening their stretch to three lanes. West Virginia is well on their way of doing that, and I know the big barrier is the bridge, uh, but I think that's going to really hamstring us if we don't really 
well, get that uh, done. Again, uh, more detail on that one. Um, yes, I have talked informally to, to staff members for all the elected officials, federal uh, elected officials, and, and I'm talking to state people saying that they ought to join in this, that the bridge is an interstate bridge. Right. And it's a huge part, and it's all in Maryland. Right. And it, but it's a huge part of the cost of mm -hmm. doing I-81. And it's true, having I-81 modernized, I think, is crucial to our economic future, the whole area's economic mm -hmm. future. And to make that a, uh, the word earmarks out of fashion, but there are other states and other places are managing to receive directed federal funds. And, and I, I, I encouraged them to think Hard about how to get that interstate I have an bridge idea. and also to get it to the attention of the people in Glen Burnie. We can call it the Mikulski Bridge. Well, <laughs> well, what about the Mikulski slash Cardin Bridge? I mean, you know, well, that you would be, be good careful too. with that. I'm yeah. okay. Or well, it happens to be that Senator Mikulski is the chair of the yeah, Appropriations think, Committee. Yeah, That's yeah. what I was thinking. But, <laughs> right. uh, but at any rate, I, I floated it out there and I floated it with state people uh, and I, I intend to float it when informally informally at the meeting I've, I've gone to almost all the when I've been available to almost all the but uh, honestly and I think uh, the, you uh, know, field trip road trip meetings with the transportation secretary when uh, you know 70 and 81 are are those are our economic engines at this point and I think that has to be a part so I'm glad to see that it's on there I don't I don't know if the priority is the status or just getting it done I don't know what you know Understood. I understand there's a lot of things going on in terms of the regional planning and, and whatnot. Well, and, and to me, there's real debates about what we should push for. For instance, I think that bridge needs to be an, at least an eight-lane bridge, not a six-lane bridge. To plan uh, for future six growth. Lane is, yeah, six lanes is probably already getting obsolete and things like that. And, um, and uh, um, so we, we need to think about what what it is we really need in this area. We have one of the most intensely used stretches of 81. It's one of the shortest, of course, but with an, and the most intersections per mile and uh, interchanges. So uh, it, it, it is kind of critical that we, that we get somewhere. But I think a big part of getting Maryland to move on it is, is finding bridge. a way to pay for that bridge. Right. Yeah. And then uh, lastly on the sidewalk, I noticed on the map and I, understand, I know what's going on with the culvert project, and I think that's great, and to connect Route 40 there with Funkstown and, uh, and Hagerstown. Is that a sidewalk going into the wastewater treatment plant? Where does that sidewalk go? Uh, no. That, that, that blue, blue line, line is not the sidewalk. That blue line just represents water. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, and so the blue line is just that little part over the culvert. That's the sidewalk. Correct. Okay. I was confused there. I was like, well, that, that's a really yeah, nice uh, it's not very clear. way to connect different parts of the city. But I just don't know what you're really going to connect. It's actually today. a uh, tributary to the right. Antietam Creek. Does it have a, a name? Is it like a... It does not have a name. So this project is in design on Frederick Street for the sidewalk. We just want to ensure that they fund that because it'll be a nice link between where the sidewalk system ends, mm -hmm. north of Hagerstown Bookbinding and Printing, and the... Uh, county's Southern Boulevard project. Right. R Rodney, I can't remember. Did we assume state funding when we approved that? I remember talking about it and approving it. I can't remember. Yes. Did it? We did. Yes. Okay, so we need to lobby for it. Exactly. And that would be the same state funding okay. that we've been using for the improvements sidewalks on Route 40 on the dual highway, correct? That is correct. It's that program, what they call their um, neighborhood conservation, or um, it's got a, a fund number now. They have several programs. They have that. They have the Safe Routes to School program. Um, I think there's another one that's slipping my mind, but that program's the same one we used in the West End to put right. that sidewalk on in, and also the ones on the dual highway, same program. I really applaud the city for, uh, for moving on sidewalk issues. I'm really uh, keen on pedestrian safety, so I think the more we can do to improve the, and, and working with the county too, because I know they really don't have any urban growth standards and so <clears throat> you know I always tell folks you can tell where you are in the dual highway if you're in the city or the county just look and see if there's a sidewalk Basically. and if there's a sidewalk you're in the city if you're if there's not you're in the county mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty evident throughout the urban growth area I think that there are two items on here and 
before I ask the question, maybe you can ask them about the substandard patch in front of Bowman Avenue. Yes, it's going to be fixed. That was um, yeah, that, that's pretty bad. Yeah, um, where the water line broke. That's going to be taken care of soon. The item number two, Eastern Boulevard corridor improvements, um, and the map that you've provided on Yale Drive extended. It while every, well everybody. While there are folks that, that generally agree that this uh, bridge uh, across uh, uh, the Antietam into this Mount Etna Farms and other properties east uh, is, is a priority, it seems that one question that we never get answer to is what is the state's role in that specific project? Because it's not a state road. Right. It's not diverting state route traffic from state routes. Um, I think Route 40 would see a, a decrease in traffic if this was built um, based on the traffic study that we did a few years ago. But it, you're absolutely not right. Not $13 it's not million dollars of a bridge worth of, of, of diversion. It's like 20,000 vehicles yeah. a year in 20 years. Um, but, but I think that, that we need to be able to put our finger on that uh, at some point because while I feel like we are pushing for expansion of Eastern Boulevard, out toward the north, mm -hmm. there is this leg to the right and this bridge across the Antietam and this property to the east that we're sort of tying to that project. Right. And I think it's important to understand what the state feels its role is going to be in those sort of two pieces. Because by no means do I want one held up, you know what I mean, uh, over the other. I don't think that's appropriate. Okay. Yeah, it, it, thank you, Kristen, because that's, a, that's a, a concern, a longstanding concern, is how to tie that in and how to justify it. And I, I would add the caveat that I add each time in which people will pretend they don't hear, but if the city is, is going to participate financially in that bridge, we need to be sure that we are tied into revenue streams from the properties across the across the high across well, the the farms needs annex I, mean, that's well, the I, I understand that but but you, there's uh, obstacles there to that annexation we can't annex it there's pieces in between our our property and the amount right. of the, the schools the no the uh, the hospital owns this site and private parties own the right. site adjacent to it and at one time wasn't it that they felt that the city were the ones that were supposed to do that bridge this was back when I was in office before so where does it stand now? I mean, is there well, actually? I have always argued that we should, that we are not responsible for that. Oh, bridge. I know, but that's but, what but they tried to say. Well, Initially, yeah, it yeah. was supposed to be yeah. the hospital I mean, because of the hospital moving out. Mm, that was supposed to be the whole it thing. It should have been done. It, in, it flew away. That it flew should have away. been done when the hospital was built. Correct. I totally agree with and you. I just don't know where it stands because, no, we should not have to pick that tab at, up. At one time, we had it in our CIP, I think. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but I don't think, you know, it's, it's not. We as staff have been saying exactly what Councilman Brubecker has been saying. So the only way the city would even consider participating is if there is, you know, a, a Well, there has to be. I mean, that's, right. you know, that's Why always been my Why stance on it. it. But right. they, right. you know, right. they that's fought that. Right. We know that it is right. right. Yeah. Um, let me chip in on that some too. I, I think getting that bridge is a very high priority. And frankly, I think we need to get it any way we can because that at some point does allow us to, to take that property across the bridge and put it in our tax base, which I think is very important to us in the future. However, and I, I do want to say this, um, John Donahue and John Donahue alone among the delegation has been talking with the governor about this bridge, paying for this bridge, and to this, with the Secretary of Transportation about paying for this bridge. And I don't know that he's He's had uh, great success yet, but he certainly started the conversation and, and made his, his views known. And uh, I, I believe that uh, the conversation can, uh, needs to continue and this needs to be a high priority in that regard. Uh, I think there were possibilities of getting this bridge in the past, but unfortunately uh, political, political Things got in the way, and it just simply didn't happen back a few years ago when it should have happened. And uh, I think it can happen now, though. You so, are right about that. So, uh, 
Rodney, I don't want to whisper in his ear, Rodney. Rodney, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, if you have an answer, if you don't know, just to say so. But it's and this is in the county, so it's not your responsibility. But uh, and eventually, though, it may may become something that affects what we do if, if we do annex these properties. The the connection between the the middle cul-de-sac. Well, first of all, the road runs into a parking lot and stops. It's, it's a road, yeah. It runs, and, and, and it, people have been made aware of that. There's no other outlet to, to, to anywhere um, once you're off the medical campus drive that runs in front of the hospital. Um, the obvious one, it comes in from the subdivisions off of Robinwood there uh, to the north, but that isn't planned right now or funded. Is, is the assumption, do you know, and, uh, is the assumption that, that will be developer funded when that parcel was built? Because I, it, it's hard to believe that it just goes into a parking lot. Yeah. So just to be clear, you're talking about the piece from the, right. what is now called Varsity. Right, we'll Varsity. Drive mm -hmm. Boulevard into here. Right. And um, my understanding is Varsity Extended is what's intended to hook up to that cul de right. I don't, I don't know what developer would do that. I mean, it crosses the lands of Mount Etna Farms. I think it's the okay. developer would be Mount Etna Farms. Farms. That's what they're doing. Okay. This connection here. Interesting. And the, uh, correct me, but there used to be two roundabouts in the middle here, correct, right? That's and correct. now there's one. This is the, the current plan. They, yeah. they uh, deleted one roundabout, changed mm -hmm. the road network a little bit to, um, to decrease the cost. And, and Another technical thing where since they changed it, professional court extended would connect to which of these two roundabouts? Um, the second one right in the middle of the page. Professional we'll courts here in the upper left. We'll just connect to the, the middle the one. Stormwater uh, management. It would go right past the stormwater management with that green, mm -hmm. light green blob on there. And it would go past that and tie right. into that stub road. Right, so, so you would, yeah, and there, at one time there had been two and it, it connected closer. Right. The road now kind of goes right through the middle of the property. So, so if you were trying to reach the hospital, you, you would come across, go around that roundabout, go down here the probably half mile uh, to the next roundabout. The next roundabout, two roundabouts up to the hospital. Right. Hmm. Roddy, you want to touch on curbs and construction design standards? Yeah, with the, we met with the county last week just to get an update on this, and the road that you see on this drawing is um, going to be what we call in engineering terms an open section road, which means it does not have curbing. It has a shoulder, and then they'll have um, swales to try to deal with some of the new stormwater management regulations. But then, on the one side, they will have an eight-foot wide uh, multi-use path for bicycles and pedestrians. So they will have some account uh, for, um, for those alternate modes of transportation. The piece that goes from the cul-de-sac towards professional court, they're designing with a with curbs. It's like what we call a closed section road, um, with with a uh, uh, multi-use path on one side. From the cul-de-sac, you mean from the roundabout? Yeah, I'm sorry. From the roundabout. Mm -hmm. So that's closed section, right? Which and the drainage is in ditches. I mean, is enclosed in structures. Right. Open section got ditches running alongside. Exactly. It's the mm -hmm. fundamental way to say. It. Right. Right. Is this is this a f which is, is not close? city standard? No. Yep. Is Curbing this, is our standard. Yeah. Is this close to what the city of Hagerstown requires? I mean, well, if we annex this, are we going to be annexing something that uh, is consistent with what our requirements are? My first and foremost concern would be that the paving itself is built to the amount of traffic that's going to be on it. If we have that, that's that's a first concern. The second concern then would be. Um, I think accounting for other forms of transportation and having adequate lanes, and I believe they are doing that. It doesn't look exactly like the way we would build a street, right? But I think uh, they're meeting those two criteria. It's close enough. So this is two lanes of a future four lane. Uh, the piece that you see on here is actually three lanes. It's uh, one through lane in each direction with a center turn lane. Is it an eventual four lane? Uh, yes, that's what the traffic study said. Yeah. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. huh. So it'll be built like Eastern Boulevard was, where you start out with two, or just three with the, the t middle turn lane, and, a, and then widen. Then and the middle turn lane turns into a median, and then you have the Katru Boulevard. And I think that'll be the case to some degree. I mean, some of it depends on where the driveways and access right. points will be. How it comes so to it's still a work in progress. OK. 
Okay. Uh, of these of these projects, it looks like two of them are of no cost to us. Um, is that right? Three and and uh, four. So that of the projects, three of them could be at some cost to us, but uh, the other two are not. Two will we will be involved. I, I can't answer that directly, but the others are either asking for funding, asking for studies, or just trying to move projects along. Yeah, so you're recommending a pretty thrifty package. So yes, thrifty package. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Any comments or any other Additions, questions? Anything we didn't get on there? All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Okay, next up are proposed amendments to the city code, chapter 176, regarding peddlers and transient dealers. Everyone should have received the proposed amendments uh, earlier today and the uh, text. Mr. City Attorney, would you like to summarize what what was the compelling reason for the changes? Well, our our current uh, peddler and transient dealer ordinance has been in place for about 30 years, um, and we have always sort of struggled uh, with uh, some of the language, the definitions, and the restrictions in the in the code. Uh, the city clerk and I talk on a fairly regular basis when someone comes in and is across the counter from her. It's not. Uh, our current uh, legislation is not real functional, not easy to deal with. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to uh, give you uh, four categories of uh, a vendor, two types of peddlers, and a transient dealer, which are defined in the code. And the basically the peddler and transient dealer definitions are similar to what we've had. Uh, vendor is for someone who's going to, uh, instead of going door to door, going to be at a fixed location. And we actually haven't had. Uh, a good definition for that category. That would be the hot dog guy. Exactly. Good good example. Um, the uh, fees have also mm -hmm. been increased. I do not believe the they have been increased for about 30 years. Um, we've tried to address the necessary exemptions for things like interstate commerce exemptions, uh, Maryland agricultural products. Some things will need to be exempt. We have exempted from the fee uh, the requirement that not a nonprofit uh, pay any fee. Um, we've exempted, uh, and a lot of these things have come up at previous work sessions, we've exempted uh, lemonade stands for up to 14 days. Um, what the one thing that's in here that I think is very beneficial to the citizens um, is that uh, the license itself will actually be issued as a photo ID card which will have to be displayed uh, when your vendor or your peddler uh, is operating. And uh, we do get a lot of calls uh, in here to City Hall when someone's uh, going door to door, knocking on the door. Uh, we're trying to figure out, hey, who's at my door? Or are they supposed to be here? Um, and uh, we've just uh, spelled out in a little bit more detail some of the uh, uh, appeal rights uh, for someone who applies and might be denied or revoked at some point. And we've also converted the penalty for a violation of the ordinance from a criminal penalty to a municipal infraction. Uh, with up to a $500 fine, that uh, that fine would then come back to the city uh, for a violation that's proven uh, in court. How, how long ago did you say <coughs> it was that when fees were last raised? I think it was in 19. It was 92. Okay. the The ordinance was originally adopted in 83, and I guess updated in 92 okay. for the fees. Any questions or comments? Mr. Munson. Those time limitations don't apply to political activity, do they? Okay. That's a peddler of a different sort, Don. Yeah, I understand, but you never can <laughs> tell us. Mr. Alshire. The first definition of vendor, <clears throat> just so I have some clarity, it says a person or entity in a fixed place of business on private or public property or the streets, or the sidewalks, or the rights of way, or public lands of the city for the purpose of selling goods, et cetera. So 
I'm, I'm just trying to figure out when I read that, it doesn't say whether the person, and maybe it's somewhere else, where it specifies that this is a person not operating in a fixed structure. Uh, well, it does say not occupying a building or structure in the second line there. In the Hold on. Itself. Okay. In, yeah, that's in oh, the ordinance Okay. Itself. So would this address the... Uh, the sidewalk sales that you see, like the, the, the shirts and purses on Jonathan right, on uh, that are generally fixed, or the vendor that uh, has a permanently set stuff out on the sidewalk over on Antietam. Antietam. And also on uh, Washington. And Washington, yeah. Antietam, I think it, it, it would apply. Oh, yeah, but the Washington's grown. It would apply to somebody that sets up shop where they don't have a shop. I think, are you talking about yard I'm sale? I'm trying to figure out they generally have a yard sale operating out of a house, right. and then they move all the junk out on the sidewalk all day. Right. It would apply. all the stuff back it, in at night. Maryland law provides for a certain number of yard sales that are permitted per year. That is an exemption in this code, and it's preempted, and rightly so. Once they're outside of the parameters of how many yard sales per year they can operate, then they would have to have a vendor license. Yeah, I'm not but sure that we're. A fixed place of business, but they? the two are. They uh, have. I mean, they it's, have it's, places of business. I don't business. know if it's an actual business. I know it's a house. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm talking about the ones that are. Okay, the but the, the situation where we have an actual business, I don't think they're going to qualify. They're, we're going to put them under this ordinance. We may have other issues to deal with on there, whether it's an encroachment into the right of way or something. Well, yeah, because the one most definitely is, and hanging onto the light poles is another biggie. I have some questions. Um, Kirsten, are you done? I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to know that we're writing something that's going to address those couple of, of consistently uh, uh, visible cases. If, if you're talking about a situation that it actually is a business, it's a store, and they're putting things out front, it's not going to apply. Uh, but I don't think this, like is, I don't think this one, is the vehicle to like address that the one that, that was problem. next to Chicks that yeah. had the tarps up. Like, I mean, that's almost what I view this Antietam Street one. That was a house. Is that yeah, and that's yeah. how I view this Antietam Street one right now. I think that's probably a situation so. where they're beyond the parameters of okay. having permitted yard sales and they would then be required to have a vendor license. Right. Do Metzner. we have, a, you, you raised in it, you know, we have examples of things that we want to not have. Uh, and they're pretty obvious. Uh, given the example of a vendor, I mean, we have the guy who's been selling hot dogs from a cart for a long time. Has anyone ever heard a complaint about that? But this would well, essentially outlaw that. No, no, this would require him to get a license. No, it would be a license, Lou. Peddler, no licensee may vend, pedal, or deal within 300 feet, which is a football field length, of a permanent store, restaurant, or other business which offers for sale goods or services which are similar or to or compete with those of the licensee, which essentially cuts out anybody from having a food cart downtown because they're going to be within 100 yards of a restaurant. But I don't know if you can get hot dogs anywhere downtown. Well, I mean, you know, Mayor, that may be a, a nice way to make fun of it. Well, but, no, I'm being serious. Uh, you can get I'm hot dogs down. You can get food downtown. Right. I mean, we, we, he, can, uh, we can address the well, distance well, considerations, well, but those distance restrictions, I think we're in a... Uh, updates about from about 10 years no, ago. No, I, I, listen, I understand, and I understand why those were put in there, and those are things for us to discuss. They were put in there because we were having problems. Bruce, remind me if I'm wrong, but what we were having were some ice cream trucks pull up right in front of stores that sold ice cream. I think it was the ice cream trucks that were the problem. We've, we've had ice cream, and then we've also had food vendors pulling up within close proximity. Right, There's right, right in front of a restaurant and, charging right. less expensive prices, and restaurants came to us and complained and said, this is unfair competition. We're paying real estate taxes. We're doing this. We're doing that. And these people are pulling right up in front of our store and undercutting our business. Now, we don't have that problem right now, though. I mean, and, and the other thing we need to to think about when we put that in there is we got an ice cream truck goes around town, at least one ice cream truck that goes around town. You know, is he going to be violating the law if he stops within X amount of feet of, of a, a restaurant? 
And, and I just throw those out for us to think about because I, I, I want to be careful that we get rid of what we don't want but we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and find that we passed a statute that does do away with things that are not a problem for us and who we're not getting complaints about. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not here to, to tell anybody exactly right now how we address that particular issue. Um, you know, the, the major cities have issues with food trucks. You see it all the time, how yeah, they, they try They have a lottery to, now in D.C. Right, them. and I mean, and we don't have the food trucks in Hagerstown yet, and they're a very nice thing for citizens. I mean, obviously, the people like them, uh, but clearly there is some degree of unfairness for those who pay real estate right, taxes uh, to be in that competition. So, you know, I don't know if we can find some way to make everybody happy or, or but that that was my only concern as I read the statute that that distance um, and, and how we handle that and I'm not sure well and I think when we addressed it 10 years ago we addressed it from the protect our brick and mortar business right yeah and uh, I think we probably went through an exercise to determine that 300 feet would still permit vendors at various locations but maybe we need to address that again um, to see if 300 is the appropriate uh, distance. Well the hot dog vendor in front of the post office that way or you know there's, there's other ways to do there's it. a restaurant right and I'm not saying it should be permissible necessarily because I it's not just property taxes uh, somebody that's in an enclosed space has to pay utilities all kinds of things and the person there, we're paying the utilities. We, we're maintaining the street and the sidewalk, and they're just using well, it. Well, that restriction's in our current ordinance. Yeah. So oh, I understand. I understand. One thing we may want to do is seek some input from the Downtown Alliance, um, uh, because the other thought process that I have is when I look at this, this that provision, you know, we weren't having problems with our downtown merchants. It wasn't a downtown issue. It was outside of the downtown area. Uh, my recollection was out in the West End, where you have a mom and pop store that is out there by itself. And suddenly, the food truck pulls up right in front of them, where they're the only place in town. Whereas, what you may find is you can exempt those distance requirements in our downtown core, potentially, but maintain them in our neighborhoods so that neighborhood restaurants have this full protection. Um, I think downtown is a relatively vibrant place uh, that probably with regards to restaurants can survive competition, I may be wrong, but that's one thought process that I would have because clearly what we wanna do is we do wanna protect the outlying neighborhood mom and pop stores and restaurants. The, you don't want somebody pulling right up in front of their curb. And that's exactly what the problem was. Yeah, but that's when the construction was going on also, up up there when they were doing um, Hope Six. Because that's when okay. he had come in and it was because you had so many workers that were gotcha. involved and they would buy from the truck. Because I know right. I had gone up there several times to speak to the owner of the store. And as a matter of fact, I've even spoke to him recently about traffic. What I want to know, Mark, is, is that now, such as the hot dog vendor, okay, will he now have to have a license? Yes. Yeah, I think he, he has already a does. He already does. Okay, because see, back when this all started with him, there was never you know, anything that was really looked at. And again, I wasn't here. So those selling snowballs, and I don't even know if that happens any longer. We, we've exempted, exempted that. Okay, they are up exempt. To, up to but, 14 but days. But 14 days, well. okay? So if you have, like we had, when my kids were going to school, okay, mm -hmm. we did it all summer. Okay. And I don't know that they even have them any longer, but that's what I wanted to know. I think 14 days came out of a work session the last time we addressed some of the problems. Yeah. But this temporary basis like just seasonal. Yeah, as far as seasonal, but now you're saying fourteen days. Well, fourteen days is too arbitrary. I assume we can we can change that. But when you well, get into the situation know, because where see you, well again, you don't know what situation you're gonna get into. So, right. you know, 
And how about the one that is down on Jonathan and Bethel, the one that hangs the clothing on the fence? So how is that considered? Well, I think that'd be a fixed vendor. That'd be a vendor, fixed location, and they'd need a license. Okay, because I know he that does have a license too. Okay. He does. Currently. Okay. But under this, he would not be able to stay there at the same location. Is that right? No, he would be a vendor, so he could be at a fixed location, fixed place, as long as he had the permission to be there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do, Lou, I wasn't making fun of it. I think oh, you raised I, an I important were, point. Sorry. No, I apologize if you thought that. But I do think it's important to get input from the Downtown Alliance to see what those stakeholders think about it. I think that's a great idea. And so right now, I mean, I think we can all take a, another, you know, closer look at this. Uh, I think it's scheduled to be on uh, for introduction at the end of the month. So what I would suggest is if you have any questions or suggestions to get with uh, Donna, and uh, talk with her about what changes might be incorporated. We can always, uh, th uh, if right. there's anything by the end of the week, we can put it on uh, another uh, work session next week. And I want to thank week. staff. I think they've done a nice mm -hmm. job, and I'm very grateful for the photo well, ID I, I do requirements. Want to ask one question for Mark. Sure. Mark. Yes, thank, thank you, staff. And um, Mr. Munson. Mark, when restaurants have sidewalk space, do they have to pay for that sidewalk space in any way? Typically, I think we do that through a license agreement. Uh, the city will issue them a license to be in a certain. Yeah, so uh, they have to pay some but fee I, for the I license. I don't know that we I don't charge. Think so. we charge. I don't think we charge. Okay. Well, Kristen raised a good issue a few minutes ago, and uh, I'd like to uh, raise it as well. Um, and that's the continuing yard sales on the sidewalks. I mean, it happens right down on Washington Street across from the TV station beside, beside the restaurant there, the El Paso. Further down the block on the right-hand side, you have a pawn shop, and they have, they have stuff sitting on the sidewalk uh, all day long, uh, every day that they're open. Um, I, I don't uh, think that uh, those, those activities are very appropriate. Uh, and we, if, if, if this can't handle it, we probably ought to look at at doing something about that, I think uh, that would be more of an uh, more of a uh, encroachment issue. We'd mm -hmm. have to see where their uh, property line ends, where the right of way for the city begins. But I think that's the way we'd need to address those issues. Okay. It could even be enforced given the current ordinances. I, I think well, so. it, the encroachment it's use of public rents. right of way, right. We can control use of the public right of way. So yeah, I because when you're painting, when El Paso was painting, well, I, if they were, if they were within so much, okay, then they were okay and it's not getting a permit. But with these that are owners of, even if they're businesses, there's not that much room to walk. Right, I think you're talking about the four yeah, clear. Yeah, right. yeah. Would it be accurate, fair to say that, you know, the role of the council is to come up with either enforcement of our current ordinances or coming up with ordinances to resolve this issue. This has been an issue I think yeah. many of us have brought up yeah. for quite some time. And uh, I think- It is in multiple need, locations throughout. Yeah, yeah. either you need to enforce what's on the books or if that isn't good enough to solve the problem, then we'd ask staff to bring back to us a solution to that. Okay, Mr. Brubaker. And then we've uh, got to move on. Just a question and a question that applies to citizens all that. When some, uh, and we've had so many door-to-door -door people in my neighborhood, it's getting to be uh, annoying. Do, do you have the right to ask to see a license? Well, with this, they're the, going to have to, they're going to have to have yeah, a the requirement under one. this would be that they I, have to have it They displayed. have to have it displayed. Yep. Yeah. So I can tell my neighbors who are also annoyed. Yeah. But you know, not yet, right? It's not required. Correct. It's, right. not, it's not, not required now. Right. New ordinance will but, but they'll have to display a license. It's yes. not, and I'm not, we're not talking about the, the uh, uh, Girl Scout cookie sales. No. Nonprofit, we're talking about sales for profit. Well, actually, we're going we're gonna to give them a license, too, but they won't have, they to, have pay. to pay for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Magazine sales. Uh, magazine sales is a big, a big issue that we deal with, but it's a future, delivery of a future good, and it falls under a uh, uh, commerce clause issue so we we struggle with that one I'm, we're trying to delivery huh. of a future good huh? delivery of uh, taking orders for delivery of future goods well, we can't require them Whoa. To how's that Interstate differ commerce. from like somebody selling freezer stuff is that like the or almost guy? anything the door to door the the yeah the the, but, but it's for a future delivery yeah. those are we have a, that's uh 
Why is not that not a we've, vendor? We've, dis we've exempted like a, a truck that goes door to door on a regular route and is expected by the homeowner. We've exempted that mm. uh, for regular delivery. Yeah, right. yeah, but somebody's selling that service, not a regular delivery. Somebody's selling the, the truck or, or coming in e either impromptu magazines. off the street I mean, or magazines. magazines. But when they're selling the freezer service, it might be we've, we happen to have it, quote what? unquote, out in the truck, or it might Wait, be. Sir, you're talking about a service now rather than a good. No, we're talking about meat or, or frozen food. It's the guy that comes around and he's got meat in his truck. It's he's not always the had it, always had it left over. That's That's always right. left over, right. right. That's a real good if, deal. If he has the goods with him, yes. he, has to, he falls under the vendor. Right. I think you're talking about capital. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. All I know is I get knock, knock on the door. But you, well, but you're saying all these somebody, I'm to still your not clear. Is what if somebody's not selling home. Home. alarm not service? Home. Not home to get the uh, services falls, any service falls under the statute. Alarm service salespeople have different regulations to follow. It's all through the county and the state. They have to have a special permitted license to right. do that. But you tell me but, if but the sale to sell of, magazines the, for their school education, they don't have to have any license at all. It's a tricky one. It's a, it's a, it's a commerce clause and a First Amendment issue. Well, kids and can buy to sell candy, and they're kids. They're not those that's college not kids. For profit. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Well, you know, let's do some more homework, and we'll come back to the table uh, at least in two weeks. What the Girl Scout selling goods in the future? We've chewed, chewed on that one enough. Yeah. 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 We chewed on October, right? Yeah. Literally. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So we'll, we won't put it on for introduction in yeah. two weeks. We'll okay. we'll uh, put it on for another work session in October. I do thank you all for working on this. I know it's been quite a task. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right. So now we're at the uh, long-term budget strategy. I know that uh, this is a hot topic as we look at uh, especially the current impending uh, budget deficit. Uh, I know that we are uh, desiring to honor our employees uh, by uh, giving them enhanced compensation. So uh, I know, I think Mr. Alshire has been the most vocal about the long-term budget strategy, but I just wanted to open it up as a discussion, uh, talk about what that strategy will be. Mr. Alshire, would you like to start? Ms. Hepburn, would you like to say? I'm actually here tonight just to kind of get some guidance and feedback, um, some direction on some of the, the big things that we've mentioned in the past. Let's start off the current projected deficit for next year is what? $3.8 million. $3.8 million. In the general fund. In the, the general, general fund. fund. That $3.8 million, um, based on decisions, that we have made to date in this budget year, has that figure changed? Not, not really. Not, not substantially. Well, when you're 3.8 million in the hole, any amount substantial. Are you talking about I, FY15 so or FY14? FY15. 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 That's not right. Current year. Uh, right. Well, I want to make it clear to people that we're not 3.8 million in the hole. Right. No. Budget year. We're That's in correct. balance no. this budget year. I just want, no. want to be clear. The projection right now, so based on an assumption so of the accessible base decreasing, is is eight uh, percent, which we have no idea. And what increase that will be. of the money we're spending, and it's not th th this deficit isn't based simply on an eight percent reduction. That's correct. I and mean, it's a based on an escalation of the amount of money we're going to spend well, next year over what we're spending this year. It's based on the projections that are in your packet, right. and those assumptions behind those projections are, are laid out in the attachment to the memo. Right, right. right. which include additional expenses above and beyond what we're spending Correct. this year. Employee compensation, right. being, compensation the largest. being the largest. Yes. Employee compensation being the largest. And some capital projects. Well, right, but that's debt service. Yes, But there is. is a big incre assumed increase in debt service. Yes. But uh, compensation and that debt service. But, but the, that big increase, I'm assuming, involves the three major, the, the major capital projects, starting with the minor league baseball and the third parking deck? And 15, right. correct. Stadium right. was, was included, um, third parking deck 
was included in the parking fund. In the parking fund, that is separate that is true. from the general fund. Um, and but unless those expenditures are made in FY14, there won't be any debt service in FY15 because debt service is the year after capital things. It's still a very big concern about how we pay for it, regards to which year it starts. But but that 3.8. The portion of it that's debt service assumes issuance in FY14, this current year. And it also assumes the 8% in the assessable base, which we don't, we won't know that until uh, ballpark of that well, January, or, uh, December yeah. or January. And right, right now, just as a reminder, as Baron Council adopted an ordinance and introduced a, or a, and a resolution for a bond issue in 2013, mm -hmm. this year, it's 4.2 million, mm -hmm. approximately, which which includes mel, the fire truck, some utility projects. It didn't include money for the stadium, the it third did. parking deck. It did not. Or any of the other major capital projects. So, so that's what we're working on right now in terms of a bond issue for the current year around 4.2 million. Yes. Right, but the budget assumed us significantly more than that, as I recall. For 15. For, for next year. For, well, for four, to spend in 14 with the debt service in 15? I that think we so. would get, we, that we would have one yeah. 2013 bond issue, mm -hmm. but then we would have a second one in 2014 to help cover a portion of those projects. Well, yeah, and this is right. 2014 we're in right now. Correct. So, so we may skate by that one because it doesn't seem those projects are likely to be occur this year. I say skate by because they are concerns about how we handle them in future years. But I think that, and this is just me, uh, but I think the most effective approach is to decide those expenses that there is a majority in favor of proceeding with and those revenue streams that there is a majority in favor of considering. Uh, in, in other words, to me, I just think you, you, you have these two lists and you go down these two lists and you say, are there three folks in favor of a fire tax? And if there isn't, you take fire tax off this, this table. Are there three folks in favor of enhancing revenue from the parking system from user fees? Me, I'm in favor of that. And, and you say, okay, are there three folks in favor of that? And that one goes on the list. In other words, I think you need to sort of put on the table first what you are and aren't going to do. And then from there, from what you are going to do, you'll know a bit more out of the gate of where you're going to be cutting and where you're going to be increasing revenue. Which is why um, I'm here. And, yes. and, and so I think that for me is the first conversation that we need to have. I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm reading a memo and I, and I know that the memo says the first thing we should consider is, you know, employee wages and benefits, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, as, as funding, uh, you know, first elements in your budget strategy. But, but for me, that, that, that isn't the first thing. It, it's certainly part of the budget, but unless I know which pieces I'm, I'm you know, that, that there's a majority to, to, to support on those two sides uh, of the, the, you know, the budget equation. I, I don't know how we can have uh, that type of conversation. Well, it seems to me that since uh, the recession took hold, the city has cut and cut and cut uh, in terms of the uh, expenditures as the revenues have decreased. And I think we have reached the critical point where uh, because of uh, past budgets and, and that the situation in, in previous years, we're to the point where we can't just keep cutting to solve the problem. And I think you, you have a good point. We need to consider all sources of revenue. We had the stormwater management fee on the table here a couple weeks ago. There wasn't any support for that. So that one's off the table. Uh, I mean, we could go down the list. I mean, we can do little uh, straw. I don't see real estate taxes. Yeah, I real wrote, estate taxes. I wrote well? that number ten <laughs> property tax in great big letters uh, because uh, you know, that's frankly you. that's what the, the city manager has recommended, and, and, and that's well, I've been the recommending for quick years. and dirty way of solving so it. So Marty, yeah. you're for that? And no, I'm not for that. 
you know. <laughs> well, I just wrote down that it's an option. Let me make a suggestion, please. Please, uh, Mr. Munson. The Kristen's right. We oh, got to know what's coming in and what's going out. Yeah. And I, the best way to figure that out is if I, I think if, if every other if every other work session we have, part of it's devoted to to aspects of the budget where this stuff is relevant. We, we, we really ought to put some intense uh, work into it, I think. Well, it, it, it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, if it's a general fund item, what, a penny in the tax rate is what now? About 250000 250 currently. 250 is what I use as a rule of thumb. So if you're proposing 250 that's not in the budget or in these projections, then that, you know, that's a penny on the tax rate. That's, uh, I understand that, but it doesn't pay for the, it doesn't pay our personnel issues. Well, um, that, that does pay for personnel. And personnel issues make us into a deficit. It, it's that much on the tax rate, or we have to cut expenditure somewhere. Well, right. and but, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's that simple, and, and, and I'm definitely not. I don't, I'm not recommending a penny on the tax rate. Yeah, I, I think, I'm just saying. But I think going straight to this conversation of, you know what, we're facing a $4 million deficit. If we cut it, the, you know, some of these projects you're looking at, maybe $3 million. Three million is still twelve cents uh, increase on the tax rate. If other folks are there and, and don't want to talk about the other things, you know what I mean. To, to offset that twelve cents, that's fine. But but I'm not there. I'm, I'm not saying it's it, it's simple and that that's what you ought to do and add to the tax rate. I've been one of the biggest defenders of not doing the tax rate. I'm just saying when you're proposing to increase the service, that's the implication unless there's a, you have a compensating cut somewhere. That's the implication. Or an alternative revenue source. Or an alternative revenue source that's general fund. Besides and if you cut a bond project, that's not, that's not uh, that much money doesn't come off the budget. It's the debt service on that uh, bond funded project that comes out of the budget. What, Mr. Altar, what do you see as the options? You, you mentioned the fire tax, parking fees, Obviously, there's property tax revenues. What other sources of revenue? Well, are let me just talk about I mentioned the fire tax because it's number two on here. Um, there's a list not, on page mm -hmm, two of right. Mm -hmm. um, for for me, uh, I think that that we need. Uh, I, I I mean, if I was going down the list, I would say I would support uh, some directed. And I think we had that conversation when Rodney was here. I would support some directed purpose. For number one, uh, I, obviously I support number three. Uh, four for the utility dividend. I support the parking system user fee uh, adjustment, um, the uh, the adjustment in the rate differential, uh, the utility tax rate, um, and, and you know, I think the vendor ordinance tonight was a prime example of you know a, a review of our service charges uh, for services. Uh, so you know number eight's uh, on that list. Uh, and again, I think that's sort of half the equation. And my goal was to look at the revenue and expense These don't affect the general revenue, though, right? parts of the budget and say, OK, I'm under no illusion that, that, that a tax increase isn't an integral part of the conversation at this point. Uh, but for me, if I can, if I can, can, can determine that uh, you know, half of it, Six cents out of the twelve is 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 doable by adjustments within the budget. Uh, you know, th 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 then I think that that's for me that that's the direction that I would proceed and the effort that I would make um, to achieve that. Uh, you know, but before we get into to, to March of next year, um, you know, Pete, you, you know. The stadium discussion is only only a week old, really, at this point, in terms of, of any uh, degree of, of you know I guess uh, finality. But you know that bond issuance for a stadium isn't a single-sided equation, where you're saving on the bond issuance right. of not having to pay that four hundred thousand a year for twenty or thirty years, but you're also talking about not expending one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year, and it's really one hundred twenty after you take out the amusement tax. That you're not going to get, but but that extra 120,000 a year. So it's not, you know, it's not that simple figure. I mean, so so, so right there, you know, is a significant sum of of you know of your annual expense. 
I mean, I understand what you're saying that it's a capital expense and you know, and it and it's debt finance, but you know, right. that, and, that and, portion and that's of certainly a possibility. But you're you're going to the null hypothesis of of not doing any stadium project at all. Uh, so you know, I just want to be clear when you throw out those numbers. That's well, without a team, I, I certainly. And, and I'm not saying. <laughs> Uh, that that's we we could wind up there because we, we we could decide it's not although that that money leverages a whole lot of other money. But I think that's why I said you got to sit down and say okay what what on the the, the spending side are we going to sit down and say that there's three votes for? I personally I've said it before and I'll say it again I support a third parking deck downtown. I do support that. I know it has an impact but, on where we're going to get the revenue. But you have to, to pay it. for it. You I, I, for I agree it. with that. Um, but what I'm saying is, I'm one vote of, of five that says yes. Uh, that item for me is, is, is a yes. Uh, I, and I think you go through that list, both on the spending side and the revenue enhancement side, and say which ones are yeses and noes. Uh, and if there's three for, for, for a third deck, then, you, then, then you, you, you plug that into your budget well, we between have now and March. And if there's not, then you take okay. it off the list and, and you know. But we have to have an analysis of what what the, the costs and, and, and uh, for, I, I think yeah. if you're going to get into that, I think to do that for every single item, uh, well, I think is 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 time prohibitive. Well, I think you, well, might, you, you, you might be able to get there if you have to. I mean, I think you can take a look. I, I'll at, do it, it then. No, I, I mean, it, 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 it's like you know, in, in my business in criminal defense, you got drug tests. Some of them are screening tests. So there's some things that people may say, you know. I'm actually opposed to this. I don't care what. There may be things. Right. A, a parking deck may be an example where, where you could say, you know, this is one of those things where I can keep it on the list, but I'm going to need more information on this. Uh, whereas there, you know, I look at number three on here on the revenue side. To me, you know, I have my own opinion. On number three. I know you said yes. I would say no to number three. So. But there may be somebody who says, well, I'm on the fence on number but three. I want some more information. You look at it as a topic in here and make a decision about it. You have to know what it, the yields are and all that sort of thing. You well, I can a, look at look number at three here. and know that I have enough information about that to know that I wouldn't well, be in favor of it. And, and that's, that's what I'm saying. There's certain things on here that we as either elected officials or just people can look at and for right or for wrong say I would support that or I wouldn't. And then there are things on here that you go, hmm, I, I really would like to discuss that some more. There's certain things that have been discussed an awful lot, either in here or elsewhere. Uh, That's uh, all. I'm and, and I want to make it clear that, that well, I, I was being overly simple because I hear, I support MELP, I support increased employee compensation, I support the service and improvement. You got to pay for it. But you got to pay for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And that part. Who supports that? I, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, Who supports that and how is it supported? Me, and that's why I said the simple thing is unless you have one of these other alternatives, and, and by the way, expenditure reductions aren't on here either. That's number 11. But um, unless you support one of these alternatives and know what the yield is for that, th then uh, you're, you're, uh, it's uh, easy to say but no, hard, hard to come uh, out with the I, answer. I understand that. And, and that's I, why I was simplifying it. Other, otherwise, Every 250000 is paying the tax right. rate, unless and, you have another source. And, and I just want to make it clear for one who... And it may be 230000 after January. Or, it might be every penny right. yields 230000 and, and, and I have, and I will say it for the record again, I think that those who serve with me know it for right or for wrong or for good or for bad, this will be at least the fourth year in a row that I have said we have to increase real estate taxes. So. I, I think one thing. I see, Penny. Miss Nye, you're nodding your head, so you would support that as well. But real estate increased property taxes. Yeah, and I think that the people need to understand how much it is on on a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and everybody and I, goes to the extreme, like, oh my, you know, now we're going to get hit again. They have to realize exactly how much it is on a hundred dollars. And, and and we have to. I totally agree with what Kristen's saying, though, and I totally agree with what Martin's saying. There, there are things we have to look at, and we've got to decide what we're going to spend and how we're going to fund it. Um, and then we have to do one of our responsibilities, is what Penny just said. We have to let the people know what that's going to cost them in real right. dollars, for one, and two, what that money's for. Um, and, and I think it's pretty safe to say right now, by way of example, 
it's not going to be for a stadium next year. I mean, I think that's pretty I clear. That's pretty safe. Right. And, and, and we have a lot of discussions about the stadium to have with the public now about, about how that works. We, we've seen how it works in Fredericksburg. It's known as private money. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Um, and it, it, as I just heard, I think Savannah's having the same issue. I think they're about to lose their team. So, I mean. Ironic that both of those teams are playing in the championship. Right. But um, I think that's what we need to do, and we need to get back to that chart, which shows the combined city-county tax rate that our citizens have paid over the last 15 to 20 years, and that combined tax rate to again establish that even at the type of rates we're talking about, we're only talking about getting up to where we used to be. We're not talking about having tax rates, combined city tax rates, that are going to be in excess of what people were paying in this community four years ago. Um, and I think it was a very big mistake we made then. I, I predicted then, and I say it again, that past administrations, past councils, have put us in the position that we are facing now. Um, there have been past administrations for the last probably three administrations, uh, administrations that everybody except Don has been involved with who made a decision long ago in our utilities that we were not going to let this happen with our utilities that we weren't going to hit people with some huge utility rate one year we were going to give them incremental utility rates every single year so nobody found out that there was going to be some horrible utility rate increase I have some big fears now that we're going to have what may be the largest, quote, tax increase that we've seen in a long time because I don't know that we've ever won more than a penny. No, we've got no, four cents. Four cents? Yeah, well, I, I, I think we'll, be, we'll be lucky if we can keep it at that, at that rate at this stage of the game. Um, but having said that, it's important to acknowledge what it's for. And, it's in, and clearly what it's for is employee compensation. And you're going to have those folks out there who say, you know, city employees are overpaid. We know what we know what we're going to hear. We're going to hear on one end of people who don't get that type of compensation, how they're overpaid. And on the other end, we're going to hear how we don't compensate our city employees properly. And we've got to make that decision. Uh, but I think we need to understand that that's really what we're talking about. It's not about stadiums and capital projects. It's about employee compensation and how we fund it. Not only how much we pay them, but what kind of amount of employees do we have? We, we sit here, I, I'd say if there's one thing this administration has heard from the get-go, it's complaints about lack of city services. Whether it's police, whether it's trash. And we didn't have those complaints in the past. We really didn't. We had higher tax rates in the past. We had higher revenue sources in the past. We had more employees in the past. Um, our employees, uh, we have asked to do much more for less. They have. And they have. Yeah. They have. There used to be a day, you know, the old days where, what do you mean you're asking me to do this? That's, that's not in my uh, union contract. That's not what I do. That person does it. That, that stuff ended long ago. And, and our employees, when this recession hit, have stepped up to the plate, whether, whether it's snow removal, the people don't understand that everybody, every person who works in the city came up to the plate for, or, or other things like that. And there comes a time when you can only continue to ask people on a one-way street for so long before you lose the good faith that they've given. And, and we've got to discuss it. And we've got to discuss how we pay for it. What percentage <laughs> of the general fund is spent on employees? Do you know that off the top of your head? It's approximately, what, 65 to 70 percent of our expenditures. I just wanted that to be clear that it is wait, wait our, people. Percent. our people. Our people. The 437 that's, or 8 employees that's, total that the city That's the approximate has. range, wouldn't you say, Michelle? I think. I actually have a schedule. 
I don't like that. Uh, you know, I didn't I mean to put you on the spot. That, that's yeah. about right. A general yeah. idea. That's 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 general. I can certainly share that. And, and mm -hmm. what is that? That's our police, our fire, mm -hmm. our parks, our roads, and our electrical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what makes the city run. And you just... Or the amount of customer service representatives downstairs, which right. affects how long you wait on the telephone exactly. and how long you wait in exactly. line. And, yeah. Another way to put it, too, the largest category is public safety. Mm -hmm. Right. I think about 80% of that is public fire. safety. Uh, the, the biggest category is public safety. I'm not criticizing. Those are the biggest departments. Comment sure. of where the money goes. And, of course, just to get on a, on a soapbox to take up for Councilmember Brubaker, if we had an appropriate county tax set off, we wouldn't be in this situation. But we don't, and we are, so that's all we can do is moan no, about it and try to get, try to fighting. repair, keep fighting it. But no, I, don't, I don't see where you and Kristen are in such disagreement. Oh, I don't, I don't think, think we're in disagreement are. at I just, all. And, and we, we, we do need to study these. Uh, right. You guys know a lot more about them than I do since I'm the, the newest guy on the council. But I think we need to take a look at Adam in some depth and clearly understand the ramifications of all this stuff. I agree with you. Uh, and, but I don't think we should wait to the last minute. We, I agree with because you. Because of Tim. the situation being the way it is, we don't have the luxury of waiting. I agree with what you said. I think it needs to, I think it needs to get on our agenda on, on either a regular basis or, or to do a workshop early on. Okay. It's, it's the fall. Same it's thing, the time yeah. to do it. Right. We could we could do a, a budget workshop and start hammering this thing out. I mean, uh, I think we, we could bring them up by category. That's what I was talking about, uh, no, having to know more detail. I'm all for I, it. I can't. Ma uh, I want to know I'm how we're going to implement one of these things. And some of them I do have uh, gut reactions like you do, but uh, uh, I think I, I still think we should discuss. Well, them I think we all feel one. that way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I just don't want to be sitting here in March and going, oh, uh, well, well, well so I, I we think, did a budget in March. Well, but I think our staff is yeah, hearing us say that we, we want to get started on this March. now. I do? Yeah, That's, we all do. Isn't that what we just uh, said? We'd like about to have two it. weeks before your regular meeting, we meet at 4 o'clock. Or maybe, can, maybe 5. Maybe 5. You can at least spend two hours on a budget work I'm, session I'm on the 24th. And sure. then let's, let's plan on doing it twice a month. That works for me. Works for me. And if we feel we need more, we'll do more. So what would be your first category or topic that you, you want to focus on on the 24th? Because obviously you can't focus on everything in the memo all at once. Yeah. You're going to have to break it down I, like you're, you're saying. Your where, where do you want to begin? Either that or capital projects. Either, I would agree. Either capital projects or revenue side. Doesn't make any difference or, to me. Or what, Lou? capital projects or the revenue side? The revenue side's a whole big thing, though. I mean, these, right. these well, are I all mean, components. Let's take the first three of the, the revenue, revenue side. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not talking about all of them. Right. And you're going to have other options on revenues mm -hmm. or capital projects beyond what's on the list. This was meant to just start the discussion. Right. So to start, why don't we just take the first three of the revenues? Right. Why don't we just go through it in order instead of arguing about it? If we're going to do it systematically, it's why fine. not do that? Mm -hmm. well, I'm fine so, with anything. So start with Capital improvement projects? Is that what you're no, saying? Well, no. I, well, we can start. I, I don't disagree with that. If we can see what shove, moving I them around would, Re would yield. Revenues is fine for us if you want to start. That's fine. Revenues. But then, then I think Dawn meant the first three on the list of revenues. Revenues. Revenue. Yeah. yeah. Sold. Yep. Okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll but, but I'm willing to start with capital projects yeah, and, and the changes or what's, where they're going. Revenues. Yeah. Revenues. The implications revenues are. Or, yeah. Revenues, yeah. revenues yeah. and capital projects. Yep. Because unfortunately, a lot of the a lot of the expense side we're going to be um, discussing. Exactly uh, well, well, I want to raise one thing though. Uh, uh, yeah, major capital improvement projects. We're talking. We're going to talk about the the detail of these major capital improvement projects. Is that right here on the well, first, first page? About detail, including well, the expenses, uh, real expenses associated with, with the stadium. The right. is associated with the third downtown parking deck. And the is associated with MELP. I think that'd right. be great. Absolutely. I think that would be very enlightening. And so by capital projects, those are the first three. There might be other adjustments, but. Let me just make sure. Okay, your first, and, and, and first, I, yeah. first three on the big. capital projects or which one? Well, any of the, the, all the capital, major capital improvement projects. Is, I think that's what Kristen meant, right? Yeah, I mean, those are the, the first three seven. biggest ones. Those are the three biggest ones. But, I mean, I, I don't want to give you too much to bite off because there's a lot of information about those first three. But for the 24th, we're focusing on the revenues right now, right? The first three revenues? 
No. Yes. Yeah. I thought that's that what that's that's what right. everybody said. First three yeah. revenues. Yeah. I heard capital improvement projects from Kristen and yeah. Don. Where we were, everybody, we are all talking. We're okay. oh, we changed to revenues. Okay, so that's all right with me. The final order that I heard was revenue, expenditures, yeah. yes. and then capital projects. I yeah. think that's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. And then we're doing we'll the first have left. three. Yeah. yeah. First three in the revenue. In the revenue. Yes. Revenues. Right. Right. And then I would just encourage you, you know, you over your 10 months in office, for example, number four, downtown revitalization projects. There's been a lot of different ideas tossed around. Right now, we don't know what that means. Right. And, and not saying we need to know right. here this well, afternoon. Well, that's almost another But, another you know, there may be neighborhood projects. Uh, we put neighborhood park projects because we've right. heard that, but you may have other neighborhood right. projects. So when you get into the CIP projects, we're going to need some help from the council in terms of what, what does that involve? What, what do you really want on the list? So, but we'll have completed revenues and then we'll go to capital projects with that knowledge. Right. Is that where we are? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good way to do it. Well, let's get the revenues first. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so five o'clock. Five o'clock on the 24th and we'll focus on those first three Can revenues. Sure. Good, good. You can but do if in we're our really planning on being there at 6.30, it's going to be hard to yes. get on to the next. Right. Problem. Well, hopefully the last item on the agenda will be short but I know that um, at least a couple members or a few it is short. for the last few meetings have been attending these meetings, uh, the lobbying coalition meetings. So I was wondering if those folks who've been attending could just update everybody for the sake of information. Go ahead, Christian. Um, we had three meetings, July 10th, August 28th. I'm sorry, we had two. July 10th, August 28th, we have one coming up September 18th. Um, three. It was. Yeah. Did I know? I don't. Yeah, maybe I was I'm, in the middle one. Yeah. No, I don't have one written down. Okay. I've attended all three. I just. Um, so, basically, what has occurred is a lobbying coalition has uh, vetted, you know, this broad number of projects that that all of the partners sort of bring to the table, and from my recollection from our last meeting. Seven or eight of these have sort of risen to the top, if you will. I think that's generally how it works. In the past, I think they generally try and, and you know, have had like this structure of four in a different categories this time. It, 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 there isn't, you know, sort of a ceiling. Uh, but ones that we talked about tonight are actually ones that are on the list, like Professional Court uh, Bridge uh, is on the transportation side, as well as widening of I-81. So those are sort of two, I think, that have risen to the top on the transportation side. On the economic development, the Maryland Theater, um, broadband uh, downtown, um, and uh, a parking deck uh, are the three un under economic development that have sort of risen to the top. Stadium obviously was on that list for, you know, for uh, obvious reasons. And then there is one that has been floating as it relates to the urban core, and that is, you know, uh, reinvestment or redevelopment of downtown as it relates to the residential side. Uh, there's been no real structure put to that, so that was sort of pushed down. And then the other one I think that, that relates to the city that has risen to the top through those discussions is MELP, you know, for, for obvious reasons that it, you know, uh, of moving forward. So of the ones I think that relate to the city, you know, the professional court bridge, the um, parking deck, broadband, and MELP seem to be the four that, that, that have sort of been at the top of that list. Now, Maryland Theater is up there, but I think that it's been generally secured that there will be a bond bill asked for and there will be, you know, uh, some desire for show of support from the city, uh, you know, as part of that process. But what they try and do, and you guys are probably familiar with the process, obviously, where they create a sort of a fact sheet because you get, you know, a very short window in front of the legislators that you need to get in front of to make your, your sort of sales pitch to for those items. But right now what they want is sort of uh, some input from the city on those items so that they can sort of start formulating those sheets and then take those sheets down to our, our lobbyist so he can kind of say, you know, right. this is going to float or, you know what, this will probably go nowhere and then come back and, and uh, hone those sheets in, so to speak, on, you know, on, on, on a more direct uh, note. 
uh, to then, then take back that final list. I would say for this evening, because I don't see any head shaking against the four that I've sort of listed. No, I'm off. But great. the big unknown that they had, and I think that they wanted some feedback on, actually there were two. One was the stadium, and like I said, I think that that is generally, you know, uh, starting to answer itself. But then the other one was the broadband, and obviously, you know, we've got some, some road to go on that, uh, in large part, I think, because a lot of folks just don't understand the complexities of it. Uh, you know, including me and, and, and the body. So um, that's where the group is. Again, September 18th, they were sort of looking for a nod from the, from the various parties or bodies of the various parties for each project that, that's sort of, uh, they're, you know, they're the leader on whether it's a Board of Ed project, you know, where's the Board of Ed sit on, on an issue or, or a city sort of related project and where the city sits on it. Um, I think it's a good list, Mayor. And, and that, that's, that's where the I can, can you read the list so. again, Kristen? I'm sorry, the ones that relate to the, the city? The four. Professional Court Bridge, mm -hmm. the uh, Broadband, uh, the Parking Deck, and MELP seem to be the four, I think, that... that um, With a great deal of interest in the Maryland Theater. Right. But that's... Right. Yeah, 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 I, I would say a bond if, if, if there Donahue. was some... If by some hook or crook the stadium materialized, obviously that would become a, a priority, but that, but would, get, that would get inserted. Yeah, but that would have to get inserted. This it's year. not right at this point. This point I mean, we have to get right. inserted in the process. All right, thank you for that update. We will move on to city administrator's comments. None for me this evening. All right, moving on to council comments. I'll start with Ms. Nye. No, I've got to wait until Holtzman's here. <laughs> okay. Public Ooh. safety. Okay. Public safety. Big time public safety. We got problems. Major. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mm, nothing Mesa. tonight. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker. Nothing tonight. I think people want to move on tonight. I agree. Mr. Alshire. Uh, just two quick things. The first is, and it relates to Chief Holtzman, but, um, <clears throat> and, and, and the city term. One, one of the items that we've talked about is, you know, you hear this issue of, you know, you need to clean up downtown, you need to clean up downtown. That's a pretty repetitive message. And uh, one of those was a question that somebody posed that I had some curiosity to, and that is uh, indoor smoking. If, if, uh, smoking. Smoking isn't allowed inside of establishments in the state, you know, how to do to the, the hookah lounges that we have sort of get around that. Um, and it's and their so, primary stock in trade. I and think. so the, the chief had some, so, some some insight on that for me, and I think that that would be a good conversation at some point. Mm -hmm. The other thing is there was a point in time when we talked about and instituted uh, rental registration, and uh, I, I think that that, that process generally, uh, for better or worse, was, was for the better, uh, but I know that there was a time when we talked about uh, an additional step to that process, and one in which I think speaks to, to you know the residential side <coughs> of things, and that was uh, at one point, we talked about a uniform residential lease uh, um, ordinance. And uh, if there is interest, I'd like to, to have a conversation about that uh, again. So, so there, those, those are the two items. The, uh, the last item is more of a personal note, and I'll just share it here because you're, you're going to hear about it anyway. Uh, is, is, you know, my, my wife is expecting, and so we went to the doctor yesterday, and, and Things are great, um, and uh, five, right? we we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, to have more than, than we expected coming out of there. So there there will be two instead of one, and, and so oh my, 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 my mind is, is a bit of mashed potato right now, and, and, and that's why I seem a little off uh, yesterday and today. So you're going to look for another job, right? In addition to the two you yeah. already have. Yes, and so. it's going to need to buy a high rise. And, uh, <laughs> And a bigger car. So if I seem scattered over the next six months, it, it will be because I'm <laughs> catering to a How demanding your oldest, Kristen? woman. Six four and two. Six four. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Mr. Munson. Um, Follow that up. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I'm trying to. <laughs> trying to. Figure. Dawn, now if you say you're expecting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just don't get into that. <laughs> um, I uh, would just like to say that uh, 
I, I think what Lou was hinting at a couple of minutes ago was that uh, we're probably not going to have a downtown stadium. That being the case, um, we, we, I think we need to s really seriously look at a vision for downtown so that we can define ourselves. I went to a I went to something over the weekend and, and a person there walked up to me and said, what is your vision for downtown Hagerstown? I couldn't honestly answer that question. Now when I look at the city, the cards that city workers have, and I flip them over, I notice that there's a vision statement on those cards. And I think we, uh, we really need to start thinking about the vision for downtown Hagerstown. Now, I know all of us are interested in education, and we're interested in economic development and, and, and others, but I think we need to be able to have some kind of a statement and say, this is the vision for downtown Hagerstown. And we talk to the media, we, able to, we need to be able to say, this is our vision. So that, that's one thing. And the final thing is that last week um, at the meeting, I gave one of our staff people, Kathy Mayer, a bad time about the noise ordinance. And I owe her a public apology for doing so. It turned out that she had written a memo, which I misinterpreted being part of the noise ordinance. And uh, the memo, when I really Talk, start talking to people in the city had nothing to do with the noise ordinance or vice versa. And uh, uh, I uh, thought that it did, but it doesn't. And uh, Kathy's a very outstanding city employee who her works her heart out, and I uh, publicly apologize for any, any uh, for my way of handling that situation last week. Thank you. Uh, just a few quick things for me. Uh, today, I uh, got to celebrate uh, Citizen Emergency Preparedness Month, which I proclaimed September 2013 to be such here in Hagerstown. Uh, also, and that is where we'll all be going, uh, hopefully all of us. I know some of us have to part ways. Uh, but there'll be a Remembrance in the Park starting at 6.30 uh, this evening at City Park. Uh, also, don't forget about the Hispanic Heritage Festival this weekend on Sunday. Porch Fest uh, is the neighborhood's first activity on South Prospect Street. Uh, starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so stop by there. Um, also, want to thank uh, all the folks with, uh, who, who organized the first Out of the Darkness Community Walk. It was a part of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It was an honor for me to be there Saturday morning to help get the walk started. It was their first event out of the gate, and they raised almost $30,000. Uh, they got th uh, four times as many people as they expected, and it was truly an outstanding uh, event. And also, I just wanted to say I got this really lovely invitation from the library uh, for the grand opening, uh, which I wanted to make sure everybody knew to mark their calendars for. It's going to be October 5th. Uh, we're going to be closing down the street. Uh, and so I hope everybody will show up. I believe the official ribbon cutting will be at 1 p.m. So, uh, yes, 1 p.m. So hopefully everybody will turn out. I'm excited about that, uh, that ribbon cutting. That will be probably the biggest ribbon cutting that we've had so far. So uh, with that, uh, we will adjourn. Thank you.